Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're <coughs> looking at a lesson titled Angelic Transition. And the first principle we encounter from the scripture <coughs> is that the resurrection will place those who participated in it into an angelic society and out of human society. Angelic society is a society comprised of craftsmen, warriors, kings, and judges, among others. Turn to the book of Luke, the 20th chapter, we want verses 34 to 36. Jesus answering, said unto them, The children of this world marry, which are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal <laughs> unto the angels. Now the word equal there comes from a Greek term which means angel-like. <clears throat> unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. The word children there is the same as the word sons. Basically, as the concordance makes it, not children, but sons. So they're going to be called the sons of the resurrection. And they are, the word is angelicos, meaning uh, angel-like. As a matter of fact, that's what they're going to be called, angels. <clears throat> Scripture teaches those who make the rapture and those who experience the resurrection will be identified as angels having shed their Adamic limitations. Turn to Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. And actually, the word there, little lower, means a little while, for a little while lower than the angels. So, basically, what it's saying here, <clears throat> for a time, they have been placed in a ray a region beneath the region in which the angels inhabit or cohabit. And crown us him with, him with glory and honor and to set him over the works of thy hands. So what the Lord Jesus is saying at the time of the resurrection, they become, <clears throat> they are raised to the level of angelic society. They become like angels. There's only two societies, actually. The divine society of the Father and the angelic society of the creation. Where we live is a temporary society which will pass out of existence. But these two are eternal. Therefore, everything in the creation society, the creation order, is basically crafted from the perspective of the angelic format, the angelic um, existence. So the, the sons of the resurrection are going to be raised to the angelic level and then ultimately dominate it. Turn to Matthew 22, verse 30. 
again a repetition, a repetition of what we're reading. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So again, he's emphasizing they reach a stage in which they are incorporated into the society of the angels. Yes. So, so the re reference to <laughs> resurrection here, is that the same thing as saying rapture, or is that a different group of people? Different. The re resurrection starts with the rapture. Those that miss the rapture participate in the resurrection. Uh, the re word resurrection comes from a Greek term, I believe it's anastasis, which means to stand up. <coughs> so the resurrection happens in stages, the first of which is the rapture, in which the preeminent ones receive the highest glory. Just very quickly. <coughs> As we are developed, I guess is the word to use, is the implication that whilst we're becoming angel-like, the angels are above us making sure that we, we, we meet the conditions. Mm -hmm. would, would you go as far as to say that? Sure. In mm -hmm. fact, that's one of the scriptures I was going to give. Turn to Hebrews, first chapter. Just jumped ahead of us a little bit. Me. <laughs> That's all right. I like it. Okay. Hebrews, the first chapter, and when you get there, we want verses 13 to 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They know that those that come out of the resurrection are going to dominate angelic society. And they've been assigned places in, in which they guide and they instruct and they do what the Father has um, mandated for them to do in behalf of those that will ultimately make it. Now, this brings us to the next principle. Scripture indicates at some point after the rapture, the spirit will begin to quicken the bodies of saints, some dead, some alive. And they will resurrect and they will appear in groups in the heaven of heavens. This should take place the second half of the tribulation period. Turn to Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you. The word quicken there means to make alive. So he's talking to the church by Christ at Rome. And what he's saying, if the spirit dwells in you, 
if you qualify to make the rapture, he'll quicken you. You'll participate in the rapture. If you miss the rapture and you go through the tribulation period and you make it right, in other words, you <clears throat> do those things that will enable you to reestablish the standing that you have, the Spirit still dwells in you. He's going to quicken you. Just be that uh, you will be quickened into a lower state of glory. We're going to see some examples of this. Turn to Revelation 11, verses 7 to 12. This is, of course, talking about the two witnesses. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Talking about Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life, Holy Spirit, from God entered into them, quickens them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So this is the first recorded <laughs> instance of the resurrection power coming upon saints. Now turn to Revelation 7, verses 2 to 4. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So, there's 12,000 of each tribe of Israel that's sealed. Now, turn to Revelation 14, <coughs> verses 1 to 3. They're sealed on earth, protected from the um, things that are going to come upon the earth. Now, Revelation 14... Verses 1 to 3. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So they're now in heaven. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. So they're raptured. So we see examples of the Holy Spirit quickening the dead and quickening the living. The same process. They remain alive. And then they ascend into heaven. This is phases of the resurrection.
Then Revelation 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So, the inference is... If the martyrs die, they don't all die at the same time. But what happens is that the Holy Spirit quickens all of them at the same time, and they enter into the state of resurrection, and they go into a particular place in the heavens. It's a methodology that starts with the rapture and it continues. The Holy Spirit quickens the dead in Christ, quickens those that are alive in Christ, and they're both glorified, and then they rise to a position in the presence of God. Yes. So the 144,000, when they're redeemed, do they, they're just ruled over by the kings of the earth? Or do they, do they have positions? No, they're part of the resurrection, so they become sons of the resurrection. They will the authorities in the kingdom at the second coming. So Just like all the other groups that come through the residents, the witnesses, the, those on the sea of glass, they're all gathered by the Holy Spirit in groups. These groups comprise the families in which they will operate for eternity. So, just following on from Brace's question, <coughs> the 144,000 are mm -hmm. members of the host which Christ bring back, bring back, brings back with them. They'll be part of the, those that return, yeah, to set up the kingdom. Okay. Along with these other groups. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so what we're looking at, yes. So of the 144,000, do they break off into their groupings of, of the 12,000? Um... No, they constitute one group. Okay. They're called the first fruits. In other words, they're the first of the nation of Israel to make heaven. Okay. Does that mean that at that point there are no more tribes? No, it means that they become a unique group. 12,000 out of each tribe constitute 144,000. They become a group that experiences the resurrection. So the tribes continue in the New Jerusalem, in the New Earth. No, the tribes at this point are on the earth. They're going to go through the tribulation period. Okay. 144,000 have witnessed to the tribes right. because they have been witnessed to by the two witnesses. So at what point do the tribes no longer exist? They'll always exist as tribes. But this group, this 12,000... No, I, I get the group. I understand okay. the 12,000. I'm not yeah. talking about this. Move the 12,000 to one side. Okay. Do the tribes continue as tribes yes. forevermore? Eternally. Right, that's Eternally. what I'm trying to get. Always, yes. They'll always exist as tribes. And are they rulers or ruled over? The tribes? Yes. They become rulers in the sense that they become a nation of 12 tribes that dominate all the other nations on the new earth. That's their pro promise. That's their inheritance. They inherit the earth. And they will <coughs> rule and reign over everything else on the earth. So literally, by what you've now said, it, 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 they end up being the chosen people then. Right, the fulfillment exactly. of the Lord's yeah. yes. covenant. Interesting. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's yes. great. Exactly. Um, they would have gone a lot further if they had accepted the Lord during his ministry. Not only would they be the chosen people of earth, they'd been the chosen people of heaven. If you were to explain that to somebody, to a non-Messianic Jew, who has always understood he or she was going to be a member of the, the ruling tribes forever, if you were to explain what you just explained to us to that person, would that person feel vindicated in refusing to accept Christ? No. No. Because 
you'd also have to explain to them the difference between their covenant promises and the new covenant promises. Yes. But uh, agreed. But they, we've just established that <clears throat> their tribes live on forevermore, mm -hmm. and that was the covenant made with Abraham, mm -hmm. and therefore, with or without Christ, because it could be argued that way, with or without Christ, the Lord, the Father, has completed his agreement. No, the problem there is for each individual to be a member of that tribe that lives on forever and ever. You've got to accept Christ. Right, okay. It's not a carte blanche thing where if you're born of the tribe of Benjamin, someday mm -hmm. you're going to live for eternally. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, there's a point in time where every member of every tribe acknowledges him as right. Messiah. Gotcha. Messiah. Excellent. Yeah. So these 144,000 come out of the tribulation? New tribulation? Mm -hmm. no. 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 But they're protected. See, the thing is, I, I know that the sacrifice is reestablished during the tribulation period. So it's actually the Lord God, it's not Jesus, right. that they are, they're still worshiping. But somehow along the line, they find out about Jesus or they decide to accept him. And that's through the two witnesses. Two witnesses start off as um, bona fide, on fire, religious Jews in the temple. And then the Holy Spirit deals with them and they convert. Yeah. And then they show to the rest of the nation who Messiah is. 144,000, these are the prototokes of the Israelite nation. They catch on. Mm -hmm. And then later on, after the two witnesses, are taken off the earth, they take up the mantle, second half of the tribulation period, and they go witnessing to the rest of the tribes of Israel. Do we have any indication in the scriptures to what percentage of Israel accepts Christ? It says a remnant, so it means a small percent. Mm -hmm. What happens is that the 144,000 witness to Israel and then Israel goes through the rest of the tribulation period and they accept the Lord at the second coming. Okay. Or they're getting ready to be wiped out by, by the beast. That's when they turn to him as a nation. Yeah. They make a covenant. Death and hell. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Scripture indicates, although they will be called angels, which they do, they will have a glory which will place them above the creation angels. Turn to Mark 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Lord never calls the creation angels holy because they fall below him in uh, glory. But he's calling these angels holy because they are, of course, the sons of God. You notice what he says, when he comes in the glory of his Father with all these. So everybody has the same glory. Now this is repeated. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So here again, this would never be caught by the average individual, but the Holy Spirit will quicken you. When Jesus calls an angel holy, he has to be a special angel. And of course, that means that his glory is above all the other uh, creation angels. It's the glory of God, not an angelic glory. 
even YHVH doesn't have this glory because he's a created being. Principle, scripture teaches the sons of the resurrection will dominate the angelic societies of the heavens. Turn to Hebrews, second chapter, verse 5. For unto the angels have they not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. And of course, we read uh, Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 14, talking about the angels being the guides to those that will ultimately be the angels above them. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? For the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 6th chapter, verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the, the sons of God, they both make the rapture and come out of the resurrection, are going to be over the angelic order. The angelic society. They inherit it by virtue of the fact that they are sons of God. The angels, all the creation angels are servants. Now we look at distribution of authority. Revelation, the second chapter, verse 26 to 27. <clears throat> He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So this is a mandate to both those that come out of the rapture and those that come out of the resurrection mandate to rule over angelic society. And we, the scripture gives us some very interesting insights into this. We say angelic societies. I'm going to give you a, a, um, a comprehension. Turn to Psalms 33rd chapter, verse 6. made and all the hosts of them are the breath of his mouth. So he spoke angelic societies into existence instantaneously. The habitations of the heavens came into being instantaneously. Now turn to Colossians first chapter. First. First chapter.
Colossians, the first chapter, verses 16 to 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is referring to angelic societies. <clears throat> in the different regions of the heavens. <clears throat> each, in, each angelic group was created for a specific function. Thrones, dominions, principalities, archangels, dawn stars, they all have a specific function for that family, for that group. Now, having said that, <clears throat> in that capacity, their societies are arranged in such a way in which <clears throat> they function as a group. In other words, a Dawn Star society exists in a certain way, accommodating that family. Um, thrones, dominions, their societies are constructed in such a way that they accommodate that particular group. Now, having said that, when the sons of the resurrection come into their inheritance, just like the signs of the rapture come into their inheritance, authority is going to be distributed over all angelic society. The only difference, the differentiation will be between the angelic society that's fallen, in other words, the Luciferians, and those that remain loyal. Now, we just read, he that overcometh will I grant, will I give authority over the Nations. Everybody reading that thinks it's referring to a human order on earth. But turn to Luke 19, verses 15 to 19. We're going to establish something. Why this can't be earth. Luke 19, verses 15 to 19. It came to pass, <clears throat> when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded those servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, <clears throat> that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So we have this parable <clears throat> of individuals being called and being given a responsibility and to see when he comes back, when he comes back, this is basically giving us a picture of his returning to earth to set up the kingdom. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful, and very little have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. What we want to look at is we're establishing a precedent here. Authority over regions of <clears throat> captivity. Now, one gets ten cities, the other gets five cities. Is that right? Yep. What we just read? Yep. Okay, turn to Revelation, 16th chapter, verses 18 to 21. Revelation, 16, verses 18 to 21. There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. So this is a mother of earthquakes. The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the cities of the nations fell. 
<coughs> so Jerusalem is split into three. Every city on the face of the earth is flattened by this earthquake. Not only the cities, but notice what it also says. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of Israel, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So the whole topography of the earth is rendered totally, radically altered. Jeremiah 51, verse 37 to 43. Babylon should become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons and astonishment and in hissing without an inhabitant. They shall roar together like lions, they shall yell as lions whelps. In their heat I will make their feasts and I will make them drunken and they shall that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like lambs, like rams with he goats. How is Shishak taken? How is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation. A dry land and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass by. So, what's being said here, there are five kingdoms that will exist just prior to the coming of the Lord. And he will destroy all of them utterly. No cities remaining. He'll destroy them through the saints. He has to. There should not be anything of the Luciferian order left standing. God will not build on the Luciferian foundation. Right. So, what we find here, Revelation, the, the second chapter, verse 26 to 27, Turn back there again. And we're going to go back to Revelation, the second chapter. From 6 to 27, He that overcometh, keepeth my works unto the end, will I give power over the nation. You shall rule them with a rod of iron, the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Now turn back again to Luke 19. Verse 18 and 19, Luke 19. Okay. And 2nd came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. The truth of the matter is, when they come back, there will be no cities on the surface of the earth to give anybody. They're all going to be wiped out. So how is it when he comes back, one gets ten cities to rule over, another gets five cities to rule over? There's only one answer to that. Either the cities are off the earth, or they're in the subterranean regions. Hmm. There are no surface cities. Everything's wiped out. So we're comparing scriptures. To him that overcometh will I give authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. So what he's talking about here are the Luciferian habitations in the other abodes. And the Luciferian habitations in the regions below the earth. Turn to Ezekiel 26 chapter and we read about ancient cities.
Liga 26 versus 18 to 20. This talks about the judgment on a city state called Tyre. <coughs> now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee. So you have cities uninhabited in the depths of the ocean. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, with the people of old times, the Luciferians, long before man's advent on the earth, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old. With them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. So the subterranean regions are going to be given to the sons of God to develop in the millennium, as well as the surface regions and those off-world. Mm -hmm. The sons of the, of, the, of the resurrection are going to rule and reign over all the Luciferian abodes, societies, along with the sons of the rapture, who will be the judges and the scholars and the instructors of those who did not join in the Luciferian revolt. So the effort seems to be the sons of the resurrection are going to get the Luciferian abodes, we rule them with a rod of iron, and those who are who have made the rapture are going to get the pristine regions of the creation to bring to fruition. Creation is going to be restored because it's going to be uh, as a result of the Luciferian revolt and the chaos that takes place in the tribulation period, it's going to have to be reestablished. So there's apparently two divisions here in which authority is going to be given a restoration of God's creation. It's going to be restored back to its pristine function, the way it functioned originally with the great wellspring and the water element coming back and um, it aspiring to uh, bring the creation to its fullest design again and it will flourish for a thousand years. 